Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, Bridging the Gap to Provide Virtual Whole Person Care Amid a Pandemic. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica DeMassa, and I'm the executive producer and host of WTF Health, What's the Future Health, a video interview series where I interview the who's who of health tech to talk about the future of health and how technology is paving the way for a better care delivery system. I am so excited to moderate today's webinar because all right, well, let's just be real. I think we're all excited to hear more about the big Teladoc Lavongo merger. And more importantly, I mean, it's the biggest digital health deal of all time, I think, but more importantly, we're here to hear about um, what this really means for the future of healthcare. I think um, the merger really signifies um, that, you know, the future of health is upon us. Uh, tech, tech enabled digital first consumer directed care is here um, and it's kind of moved up a level. And so we're gonna dive into all of that today and we'll also get to hear uh, from one of Lavongo's big customers, um, the state of New Jersey, to hear from their perspective um, what it's like to implement the Lavongo program, um, particularly you know, to and through the COVID-19 pandemic. So joining me today, you're going to hear from Kristen Deacon. She is the Assistant Director, uh, Division and Pensions and Benefits. At, New, at the New Jersey Treasury for the state of New Jersey. And Dr. Jennifer Schneider, she is the president of Lavongo. Um, a quick overview of the hour. Uh, we are gonna start out hearing both Jenny and Kristen talk a little bit about their respective organizations and what's going on in each one. Jenny is gonna spend some time talking about Lavongo's whole person approach. And then Kristen will share some details about the state of New Jersey's experience with Lavongo. Um, how Lavongo has been impacting their employee and retiree population of almost 600,000 people and how they decided to expand their offering from Lavongo's diabetes program into the whole person platform, including behavioral health. So we hear from them first and then we get a big 30 minute Q&A session with these two so we can chat about uh, a little bit more about all of the things that we want to uh, hear about and you guys can submit your questions too. Uh, last thing before we get started, some quick housekeeping stuff. So submitting those questions, you've got a Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen or so I hear. So please feel free to put your questions in there and just hit enter to submit them. We'll be curating them as the session goes on. So if you want to, if something comes up and you want to ask it right away, please feel free to type it in. Somebody will be monitoring all of those. Um, and then we will get to them when we get to the Q&A portion at the end. Um, if you have trouble seeing any of the slides at any time, the hot uh, tip here is to press F5. That will refresh your screen so you can see all of the slides. And if you miss something, if you have to walk away, don't worry, today's webinar is being recorded and a, uh, an archive of today's event will be sent out to you a little bit later this week. Uh, and one last note, please remember CE credits are not available for this. So if you're in this for all the wrong reasons, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> please note that we are not offering CE for this. All right, here we go. Without further ado, let's jump in. Like I said, we're going to get started with Jenny. So um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Schneider. Uh, she is one of my favorite clinician executives in the healthcare industry. Uh, Jenny previously served as Lavongo's chief medical officer, and she is now president. Uh, she is responsible for product, data science, engineering, marketing, and clinical operations in that role. Uh, before coming to Lavongo, Jenny practiced medicine as an attending physician at Stanford University, the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System, and Kaiser Permanente. As if that was not enough, she's also an author. Her book is Decoding Health Signals, Silicon Valley's consumer-first approach to a new era of health. Um, and she was just named one of modern healthcare's 50 most influential clinical executives of 2020. So see, I'm not the only one out there who loves her. Uh, and last but not least, certainly not least, uh, Jenny is the mother of three kids. She's an avid runner and athlete, and she's lived with type one diabetes for more than 30 years. Uh, everybody, please join in wherever you're at and welcome Dr. Jennifer Schneider. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much for that introduction. And as always, it is a pleasure to get to be speaking with you. And I'm doubly excited because um, I'm a fan and admirer of Kristen as well and the work that she's been able to do. So excited to be a part of this team. Thanks so much. We'll actually um, go to the next slide. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to start, um, for those of you who do not know Lavongo, Lavongo's mission is really about empowering people with chronic conditions to live better and healthier lives. And we do that through three different components. The first is um, seamless data capture. 
The second is leveraging that data in the same way that uh, people do today in other industries to create an incredible experience. And then the third is coupling that to humans when the things go off the rails. We have really started and focused on chronic conditions. And this slide I think is incredibly telling. Um, we know that chronic conditions do not exist in silos. So if you look across the United States, on average, 6% of us in the United States are living with diabetes. Of those 6%, 56% have high hypertension, 85% are dealing with weight issues. Similarly, if you look across pre-diabetes, 34% of adults today have, are at risk for developing diabetes. You see a prevalence of nearly 20% of behavioral health in that bucket. So these Venn diagrams are hugely overlapping. They're not in silos. They exist across multiple people, multiple different conditions. Next slide, please. Um, again, the biggest thing that you can do in terms of um, uh, escalating and, and enhancing and empowering the lives of people, and I'm one of them, living with chronic conditions, is to actually understand that not only do we have multiple chronic conditions, but really when we wake up at the beginning of the day, we simply want to be our best self. You can go ahead and click through. This will give an experience. We're looking at what is your morning weight? What do you think about nutrition component in the setting of your weight? How does that actually impact the exercises that you're doing from a behavioral health standpoint? The remote monitoring and the ability to intervene with coaches. We need to have a seamless data connection to offer an experience that allows people to simply be their best selves. Next slide, please. Talk about the cost of chronic conditions, and I know Kristen will speak to this as well and why uh, she's seeking solutions here. Uh, chronic conditions today drive 90% of US healthcare costs, nine zero. It is a large, large number. That's over $1.1 trillion in spend. And it's interesting because if you look at the overlap of chronic conditions where we started with that opening slide, when you have the, uh, the existence of more than one chronic condition, the expenditure increases. So people living with multiple chronic conditions become much more expensive. And we know that about 40% of people living with one chronic condition have two or more. Next slide, please. So the solution that we've really spent time in designing is all about enhancing behavior. And, and you do this, if you think about how you live your life today and the touch points you have with technology-enabled services or technology-enabled experiences, they make, your, they make your experience better. So a couple examples for us are we're able to collect the data through our cellular connected blood glucose meter, cellular connected blood pressure meter, cellular connected scale, and understand an individual person from their biometrics. We also understand their preferences. For example, I know that Jessica is going to get out of the smoke pretty soon. So as I'm understanding that information, I can personalize my message to her about where she's actually going to visit her parents into an area where she can get more outdoor exercise. When we're able to do this and offer these personalized health nudges, we see that greater than 60% of people opt into what we're doing. We see that 75% of when we do five day challenges um, uh, complete their first challenge. So this idea around being able to drive um, individual behavior change, you see it in other industries, you see Amazon doing that for your purchases, you see Google doing that for your content, you know, searches that flow to the top. We're able to do that in the world of health because we understand not only what somebody will benefit from, but the way in which they want to receive that information. Next slide, please. This is an example of uh, us being able to meet people where they are currently in the pandemic. And I think it's, it's a really interesting component. So we've noticed that um, we've seen an almost nearly a threefold increase in the number of coaching sessions. And so this speaks to utilization in the setting of a virtual care consumer directed world while the pandemic is happening. External utilization of healthcare resources have really gone up. I also think it's really interesting and probably no surprise, um, Kristen uh, has a child who's napping in the background and there's a low level stress that that child may wake up, my seven year old's hidden in the other room here. My point is um, in this world where we have some underlying stresses, we've noticed in our members who are, are using the blood glucose meter that we've seen a twofold increase in people who tag their stress button, even if their blood glucose level is normal. So again, looking across what's happening in the ecosystem under the current pandemic allows our system to adopt and deliver meaningful messages to people exactly where they are at exactly the right time. 
Digital program effectiveness. This is one I get asked a lot about in my current role and my current um, speaking. And I think, um, you know, this is a, a really illustrative slide, but first and foremost, it has to be simple. You can't create something that's complex, requires new rules or new actions to get people to use it. Simple and easy, out the gate, win the day. So being simple and easy. Learning uh, fast and being iterative in your approach to understand the data and improve consistently is really important. That allows for continuous utilization and continuous improvement to drive those outcomes. And really what we're trying to achieve um, in digital health is personalization at scale. Docs are effective because you get to know your doctor. She's incredibly nice. You come into the office, she understands your kids' names, your pets' names, but it's not scalable. And so for a digital program to be effective, it needs to be scalable in a hyper-personalized way so you can create a one-to-many solution. With that, Jessica, I'm gonna turn it back to you so you can introduce um, my colleague and a friend, Kristen Deacon. Oh, no, 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 no. Do not think you're escaping that quick. We have, I have seven minutes on the schedule to ask you some questions about your presentation. And so, okay, you know, okay. big, big, I'm sure you're tired of talking about the merger, but I guess the way I want to ask about it is based on what we just saw. I mean, I noticed, I mean, I've, I've followed along with Lavongo from really the beginning before you guys even went public and I saw some new things in here. And so I want to ask, you know, about the merger in the context of what we've just seen here. How much of what we're seeing, you know, on these previous slides or, you know, that that's being reflected in the way that you're thinking about healthcare now that you, now that this merger with um, Teladoc has happened and you're starting to plan for the future with them, you know, how much of that is, is reflected in what you're showing us here and kind of what are the next steps for it? It's a, it's a really great question um, and thank you. Uh, uh, as, as you can imagine, I could not be more excited than our merger with Teladoc for a number of reasons. The biggest of which is that we will be able to execute on our vision so much faster and reach more people at scale in an unprecedented way. And so what I described as using digital healthcare to drive a hyper-personalized experience for people we can now think about doing that not only in chronic conditions, but across that whole spectrum of health from acute to episodic to chronic. And, and even furthermore, we're able to actually turn the paradigm on its head. And with the utilization of prescribing powers that Teladoc has, therapists, we can actually treat people where they need to be treated when they need to be treated. So rather than you have to go to the doctor's office every couple of months, you could say, actually, Kristen doesn't need to go to the doctor's office, but holy cow, we gotta get Jessica in every other week, right? And we need to, we need to make those matches. And we can do that in a way by understanding the data we can also, the other way to think about the care delivery system is we can use this data where the doctor is not in constant contact with the, with the patient. You can use the AI algorithms to understand what needs to happen and float that directly to the physician. So all of a sudden you're opening this world where people are allowed to practice at the top of their licensure and you meet people where they are. Maybe I'm tucked away in my son's bedroom right now because it's the only place I could find that was quiet. You can meet people where they are deliver the service that they need and escalate, but without a three month or three week wait to go see the specialist, you can escalate in the time of need because you can understand what that need is. So the, what I described is absolutely true, but it's kind of on steroids, if you will. And um, you know, I, I often describe, we built the system from the consumer into the provider system. Teladoc built from the provider out to the consumer and we're meeting and we're able to meet at scale. Teladoc covers 70, million lives. My data scientists, you know, start to drool when they think about what we can do with the combination of our platform setting to deliver a holistic experience where you deeply get to understand somebody and empower them and make their life and their experience of healthcare simply better. You know, you guys have seen an uptick in utilization too as a result of the pandemic. Teladoc saw it at first and then there was there was a point there where things started reopening and the numbers started trending down. Do you think that our experience with, with telehealth, with remote monitoring, with virtual care has been sticky enough as a population? I mean, you mentioned that the big number of lives that Teladoc has, has access to. You know, has it been sticky enough, the experience with digital first or, you know, digital, you know, co continuously in the home that people are going to make the switch? and continue to, to demand those types of experiences for their healthcare delivery. 
Yeah, the, the phrase, the genie is out of the bottle, I've heard used, but we've all seen the cartoons where the genie gets sucked back in. And I heard a better phrase as a mom, which is the toothpaste is out of the tube. <laughs> not get that stuck back, back in. in. <laughs> So I, I do I do think um, what the pandemic has done is really accelerate our business model um, from the healthcare delivery side as well as from the consumer side. I think virtual care was accelerating from a consumer centric experience, but not as much from a healthcare delivery side. And I think you're seeing that acceleration in both areas. And I do think the toothpaste is out of the tube. All right. Well, Jenny, let's leave it there. We'll come back to you when we get to our massive Q&A session at the end. But um, I'd like to give Kristen an opportunity to chime into the conversation here and share her experiences at the state of New Jersey with us so that we can hear the employer perspective and, and what it's like to roll out this whole person program uh, to a population. So without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kristen Deacon. Um, she is the Assistant Director, Division of Pension and Benefits in, in the New Jersey Treasury. So for the state of New Jersey. She is responsible for operations, policy and planning for state and school health benefits. Um, she previously served as assistant counsel to the former governor of the state of New Jersey and was the a deputy attorney general for the state's attorney's office there. Um, Kristen engaged in private practice as a corporate restructuring attorney in Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, and was the former chief law clerk to the chief bankruptcy judge for the District of New Jersey. My goodness, what a background. Uh, she is a dedicated mother of three little ones, two, four, and nine, and I think it was the two-year-old we're worried about, right? So if we have a special guest star <laughs> pop in here, we're going we're gonna to welcome, welcome him or her to this conversation about uh, virtual care and see what they think. Um, and more recently, she's become, as a result of the pandemic, a remote learning and Zoom teacher. I love that. A self-described public sector entrepreneur, uh, Kristen is always looking to question and push the status quo in the name of public stewardship. She's an avid sports fan. We have another athlete on our hands here, a runner, soccer player, uh, tennis star, um, and oh, also a golfer. So Kristen, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing about your experience with Lavongo. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Um, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to engage in this conversation and so much of what Jenny was talking about. I can't wait to really dive in with her and, and get to her points as well and echo some of those um, points. Um, so just a quick overview of our population to level set. Um, we, have a, we cover a total of about 800,000 folks that represent actives, early retirees and retirees, including our Medicare population. Um, you know, and this includes, uh, you know, a, a really diverse group of individuals. The population that has um, access to Livongo is uh, about 600,000, and that's our active and early retiree um, individuals. And, and you can see here, um, again, dealing with a population that size, our members living with diabetes, about 50,000, 50, um, hypertension, 140, and, um, you know, uh, with what you don't see here on from a behavioral health perspective, but what we know is that we have a behavioral health um, crisis that was on our hands really prior to the pandemic, and uh, our, you know, strategy with the rollout of the whole person solution is really pre-planning for what we know is going to be the fallout from, um, you know, COVID, especially with our population being as diverse um, and public facing as they are. So, go on. Um, so this slide sort of represents um, the way I like to think about the various components of our plan. I think as an employer or you know, somebody that runs a health plan, we all know that you spend a tremendous amount on that, you know, what I'll put in that top of the triangle. You know, 30% of our spend um, is taken up by 1% of the population, um, you know, considering drug spend and medical. Um, and, you know, that's once you start um, an individual in, you know, at that bottom of the triangle, you're really looking at, you know, usually young, healthy folks. And then as they age or, or have more conditions um, and comorbidities, you start to creep up that triangle and, and get to that top 1%. And we tend, I think historically, health plans have tended to really focus on that top um, piece of the triangle because that's where your big, big spend is. And, your high cost claimants and how do we reduce, um, reduce those claim spend um, from both a utilization and a unit cost perspective. Um, but I think, again, going back to that whole person approach, 
I want to keep as many of our members in that lower tier of the triangle for as long as possible. And so thinking about our members, and you'll, you'll hear me always be very careful with the, the language I'm using, our members, not our patients, um, you know, we want them to engage in the healthcare system, not just as patients and not just as, as sick um, individuals as they climb up that triangle. We want to engage them at all levels of that triangle, um, wherever they are in their healthcare journey, and work to keep them, you know, to echo what I think what Jenny said is uh, to live their best lives um, wherever they, they fall. Um, so not neglecting that lower tier is really, really important to us. So we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this, uh, you know, going back to the whole person approach, um, you know, I think COVID has helped us to accelerate thinking about um, time outside of the healthcare system but because we've been forced to, right? You know, we were telling members to go get screenings, to go engage with your PCP, to go, you know, um, engage in the healthcare system in a, in a physical way. Um, or in person, and then when that all stopped, you know, we were already moving in the direction, like with Lavongo as a partner and, and some other point solutions um, to move ahead in the digital space. Um, but what COVID has done is really, um, you know, propelled that, what I think would be a multi-year process forward. And I, and I agree with what, um, with what Je Dr. Schneider said about, you know, I think we were heading there from a consumer perspective, and, and I very much feel that that's, um, that's the sort of the direction I'm moving from. Um, but there was always the, the pushback from the status quo on the provider community, like what was that going to look like for them to provide telemedicine? Well, we see that, you know, from our, from our numbers, our providers very quickly pivoted to be able to, to provide telemedicine to their members. Um, not just, you know, via a telemedicine or virtual platform um, that existed pre-COVID, but um, they started to engage and, and get creative and figure out how to deliver care digitally. Um, so again, I think that COVID has um, really crystallized the needs, need for and propelled forward um, at a much quicker pace our approach to, um, you know, digital solutions because Again, you know, we don't want to think of our members' interaction with the healthcare system only being, you know, when they're at the ER at a provider's office. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so just for us, the, we, uh, again, move forward with the whole person solution, and, and this is just a, a visual of what is available to our members. Um, you know, we always knew we had an issue on the clinical side with diabetes, hypertension, and how we were um, you know, delivering services. Obviously, we found Lubongo as a partner and we're very excited to move forward in the whole person solution. But what really pulls it all together to me is that behavioral health component. And um, we're just really excited about um, everything that the, this will have to offer. You know, with respect to behavioral health, and I think I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but um, we often look at behavioral health um, as a supply side issue, right? Like we have a behavioral health crisis because we don't have enough providers and we have, you know, I think it's like 3000 childhood um, psychiatrists in the country. And we all know that there's an overwhelming need for child psychiatry. Um, so we tend to think about the provider shortage, but I think we also have a demand problem because what we're demand, you know, what my child might need from a, um, a therapeutic or behavioral health perspective it might not be that you know uh, child adolescent psychiatrist it might be something that their uh, primary care provider equipped with a digital solution might be able to help my my child with um, so i think we have to look from a demand and a supply side with how to tackle what we know is going to be a behavioral health challenge in the future and making sure that we're making the most efficient use out of all of the tools available to us and at our disposal, um, you know, and making sure that folks are able to practice, um, you know, the providers that are out there with those licenses are able to be leveraged in the most, most efficient way for the members that, you know, need them depending on their, their um, you know, their own healthcare journey. We can move to the next slide. 
Um, so yeah, this uh, dovetails right in with you know some numbers for us on behavioral health. Um, I, I won't regurgitate the numbers that are on the page, but you can see when 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 coupled with behavioral health and chronic conditions, the cost um, increases obviously for the plan. And so as a payer, um, you know these numbers are very important. And I think if if you were to look at only tackling uh, things like unit cost, contract management, um, you know, tougher negotiations with your TPA or your PBM, you miss out on a huge opportunity to really turn the needle from a cost perspective and addressing the underlying, really underlying health conditions. So I think you still have to do those things on unit cost perspective and, and managing um, your vendors and your contracts tightly, but, but understanding the real drivers um, when it comes to uh, comorbidity and behavioral health conditions impact on cost, I think um, it might drive a different um, solution for your plan. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so I think everybody on the call uh, or on the, the webinar might, you know, recognize um, everything on the left hand side of, of this slide is, is some might call it social determinants of health, barriers to care. Um, but and they're real and they exist and they they exist in even uh, you know at a greater to a greater extent during COVID um, and these are barriers to care for um, behavioral health and other conditions. Um, from a payer's perspective, I, I often hear about social determinants of health and barriers to care. But what I have struggled with is what are those things that we can act on? What are the actionable social determinants of health or barriers to care? And that's where you find solutions like Lavongo, like you know, more digital um, and forward-thinking solutions um, that can, you know, I'm just looking at the slide here, like stigma, right? So a good example of a solution that we were able to present with our members during COVID was um, you know, a substance use disorder specific um, digital health provider. And so we're not able, not only able to help members that we know are suffering from these conditions, but they can do so from the comfort of their own home. And um, so I think, you know, some silver linings, COVID has, again, just um, really crystallized the need for some of these solutions and uh, removed some of these barriers to care. So next slide. So um, this is a little more nuts and bolts about practicality and rolling out um, a program like um, a Lavongo whole person solution to our members. Um, you know, we're unique in the sense that we're, we are public sector. We cover a variety of types of individuals, um, you know, union organizations, and it's not just one union, it's multiple unions um, uh, across, uh, across the board, local governments, um, teachers. So, in rolling out um, this type of solution, we have to be really thoughtful about the communication strategies. And that means not just communicating with, uh, you know, our leadership and um, partners um, across the state, but through them, right? And leveraging all of the, um, the uh, channels that we have to communicate the, not only the availability, but the functionality and um, benefit for everybody of, of the model. Um, I like to, you know, on the, you can see on the slide talking about like formulary updates and it's really anything disruptive for our members. I think it's, we always have to, um, I would like to use a narrative, uh, not one of cost savings, but more one of um, making room in the health plan to continue to deliver really um, best in class care for our members. So for example, on the, you know, on the formulary side or drug side, um, if a generic comes out and that means that a member has to move from a brand to a generic, it's not about a cost reduction. It's about making way for that life-saving therapy that might come out, uh, you know, down the drug pipeline next year. Um, so I always like to make sure that the narrative is not one of cost savings for the state or even really for the members. It's, it's about providing best-in-class care for our members and continuing to do so. Next slide. Um, so this is just some demographic information about who's enrolled in, um, in the plan. As you can see, um, mostly it's uh, our members and not dependents. Um, and one thing that was surprising to me, I, I did uh, expect more female enrollment. Um, we know that they're the more active decision makers 
in um, our, you know, in benefits decisions with their families. Um, but as you can see here, I mean, it's a pretty even split with, uh, with male and female, but um, just some interesting statistics on our membership. Next slide. Uh, again, these are, um, I, I won't regurgitate the facts off the, off the page, um, but I, I think, um, you know, just some important things to highlight here. Um, the, you know, the health nudges that Jen, Jenny talked about, Dr. Schneider, I'm sorry, um, I think are really important. And for our members, um, you know, because we cover such a diverse population, I do at the end of the day feel like healthcare should be local and personal. And what this data-driven approach does is it takes a population at, of our size and, and diversity, and it enables us to deliver healthcare in a more local and personal way which I think is really important, um, important for members. You know, what might work for a, a retired um, a cop is probably not the same thing that's gonna work for a, a fresh, new, um, young female school teacher, right? So that personalized data-driven approach, um, I think is what leads ultimately to our success. Next slide. Again, these are um, just some statistics on, you know, how our members are doing with their checks. I think, you know, an 82% weekly check-in is, is really um, strong. Um, and as you can see on, uh, on monthly check-in, we're, uh, we're actually beating uh, Livongo's book of business. Um, but, you know, really positive results from an engagement perspective, especially for our population, which we've historically struggled with engagement as a result of our really um, sort of the diffuse nature of our population. Next slide. Um, and for all those payers out there, I think that you can see how significant um, the success rates are here with reducing um, A1Cs for our population in the very short time that we've uh, been with Livongo. So, some really promising results, and uh, we're excited to see what the future holds. And these are some of some of the feedback that we've received from our, our members on Livongo. It's been received overall, obviously, very positively, um, and uh, you know they're just excited to have access. Um, I think in a lot of, in a lot of ways, public sectors can be seen as. Um, behind the eight ball a little bit when it comes to whether it's technology. Um, but I think from a health plan perspective, um, we're, we're right up there with, um, you know, being for, as forward thinking as we can with the solutions and services we're providing to our members. So with that, <laughs> Jessica. Kristen, great job. Thank you so much for walking through all of that. Before we bring Jenny back, um, I just want to ask you real quick, you walk through, I, I love hearing you talk about the impact of rolling out the whole person platform, not only like, you know, from, you, you covered basically everything from dollars and cents, right down to some of the, the actual, you know, impact on um, health status and, you know, some of those biomarkers that you guys have recorded there. When it comes to what's been most important to you, you know, as a payer, like what are the, what's the outcome that, that you're really the most excited about in terms of, of, of everything you've just presented there? I think for, with the whole person solution, um, it's creating an, really an ecosystem of solutions and tools for our members to keep them, you know, to Jenny's point, to help them live their best and healthiest life, right? And from a payer's perspective, obviously, I'm always looking at claims costs and trends. Um, but, you know, from a, from a public employer employee perspective, keeping our employee workforce healthy and, um, um, and productive is really important, obviously, you know, to the state employees and to their families, but also to the residents of the state of New Jersey that, you know, help fund some of these benefits. So I think, um, I, I think it's uh, focusing on the health and well-being of our members um, if that's always your goal and creating that ecosystem to help meet people in their health journey, wherever they are, the dollars and cents will, will follow. And I think that that is bearing out in the, in the numbers. 
Okay. Well, let's bring Dr. Schneider back and um, I'm going to talk to the two of you. I and mean, we've got quite a bit of time. I'd like the, to invite the audience to submit their questions. We've had a few come in already. So um, please continue to submit your questions for both Christian and, um, or excuse me, Kristen and Jenny, uh, so that we can find out what it is that is on the top of your mind. Um, I want to kick off this Q&A portion by talking about something. I want to kind of go big picture here, if I can, um, with you two. Um, so I, I do, like I said at the top, I do a lot of interviews with people who are working in health technology companies, and then also people who are buying those solutions. And one of the most provocative ideas that I've come across lately is this idea. It's actually a phrase that came out of um, Crossover Health CEO Scott Shreve. He said um, that he believes that employers are becoming the most innovative payers in healthcare, and he calls them health activist employers. And I love this phrase because I really feel like it does kind of capture the spirit, especially when it comes down to integrating more virtual care, digital health type solutions into a full on benefits package to take care of a population of people. So I would love to hear, you know, Kristen, I'll start with you if you can, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think that within recent times, um, particularly as, you know, the pandemic has unfolded and employers have really found themselves responsible for managing the health of their employees in new, different and expanded ways. Do you think that it, it's fair that we're kind of entering an era of the health activist employer? Yeah, I mean, I think that we were probably entering it a bit before COVID, but it's certainly uh, propelled it forward at a much quicker pace. Um, you know, the system, I call it a system, that's, I'm using that term loosely to describe the current healthcare system, but what's existed um, has the status quo, right, has worked for hospitals and providers, and it's worked for insurance companies, and it's worked for PBMs, and it's worked for drug manufacturers, um, but you know, it hasn't really worked for the consumer and it certainly hasn't worked for the payer, right? So the idea of um, set it and forget it from a health plan, you know, design perspective or it is over. The idea, especially on like the drug side of, you know, a paid claim is a happy claim. Like those days are gone um, and they have to be, um, you know, especially again, as a steward of, you know, tax dollars in New Jersey, it's, it's become our role uh, out of necessity. And um, I think because we're the only ones that have, are poised to do it, to say things need to change and we have to get more creative about the way we're delivering um, healthcare to our members. Jenny, you want to jump in on that? What have you been hearing? I mean, you guys, especially as you're, you know, you're, you're building this, you know, full end-to-end -end virtual care, whole person platform, and you're, you're working with employers um, of, of different sizes. I mean, would you agree or what would you add? Yeah, the only other point, and, and Kristen touched on this, that I would add is, um, uh, first of all, I love the quote from Scott Shreve. I, I know I've known Scott and I'm a fan of um, him and his work, but I, I also say the employers have um, the dual benefit. They're not only concerned about healthcare costs and not only driven by actuaries, they're also concerned about productivity and in retention and recruitment. And so as you think about like, like thinking truly about the whole person, they're actually looking at multiple other dimensions to take care of in this health journey. And so I, I've often found that it, that is the reason why the likes of Kristen and so many others whom are on this webinar are highly innovative because you have a lot more at stake um, than traditional health health insurance or payers, if you will. All right, Kristen, I want to jump in a little bit on the issue of employee engagement. And, and Jenny, please feel free to weigh on in this too, because I think this has been the challenge all along with the, with, uh, from a payer perspective, from an employer perspective, is how do you get your population to use this stuff? I mean, it's not enough to just, you know, to get it, to put it out there, to make it available, to pay for it. I mean, how do you really make people want to use some of these solutions in order to, you know, maybe do some of the, the hard work in terms of monitoring their health or helping them achieve better care? And Kristen, I'm wondering if you can just share with us some tips. And I love what you said in your presentation about your, your population and maybe start there for us. Give us a sense of those demographics a little bit deeper. I mean, you've got everybody okay. under your umbrella from the retired cop to the, uh, the retired male cop to to the you know, young female school teacher, I think that really, I mean, th there is a big difference there. So how do you, you know, create, how do you offer something that that whole population can find themselves like, yes, this is for me, find themselves in that offering? 
Yeah, I would just start by saying I think we have a long way to go with the health plan and improving our communications, but we are, we're on that road to, to getting there. Um, so just a little bit more about our demographic. We cover all state employees, um, which you know includes your um, Department of Family Services, um, our you know public psych hospitals, Department of uh, our, like our uh, Departments of Veteran Affairs uh, facilities. Um, so we we cover a lot of frontline workers. Um, we cover all of our state um, uh, firemen and cops, and then we also cover uh, and and employees like myself. So I, I get the benefit of the plan that I administer. Um, we also cover about 70% of local governments that are located inside of New Jersey and about 45% of the school districts that are located in New Jersey. Um, so the locals get to opt into the programs. Um, and so that would include local firemen, police officers, teachers, um, and local, local municipal and town uh, and counties. Um, so it's a real challenge across the sort of the diversity and then also just the sheer number of people that we cover and then we also cover retirees that live all over the country and indeed all over the world um and so how i do you engage them how do you get them to try something new right you know, as how do you, a, a digital solution especially that retiree population or maybe a population that's you know you know not sitting behind a desk for the majority of their work day i mean how do you get them engaged right i think it's making the solution relevant to them I think number one, it has to start with trust. And I think we have a long way to go as like a health system in earning the trust back of our members. And again, I say members and not patients because that's how a lot of people think about their health plan. It's something there for when they're sick as opposed to something that's there to keep them healthy. So changing that mindset and shifting that culture um, and then leveraging really every channel that you have and finding the source of trust for that that subset of population. For example, if it's your, your teachers, it's for New Jersey, it's likely their teachers union. Mm -hmm. And so leveraging the trust and getting buy-in and, um, and educating their leadership so that, you know, find out who your members go to for their information and, and trusted information, and then bring them under the tent to make sure that they're all part of the decision-making process and the communications process. Um, again, to start to earn that trust back from a health care perspective. All right, once they're under the tent, Jenny, tell me how we make them fall in love with Lavongo. Because as I recall, it's not enough to just like it. You have to love it. And I think I mean, you guys have a net promoter score that kind of shows that. But you really leverage data science and some of the stickiness of, you know, really some of the tricks that, that other tech companies have been using in different ways outside of healthcare to keep people engaged and to keep the experience personalized and something that that is, you know, um, something that they want to go back to and stick to. So talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, and you're right. I, I often say uh, being liked is waiting to be replaced. You need to have people love the experience. Um, and um, I, I just want to underscore what Kristen said really eloquently around in, enrollment or engagement. And one of the things that we do and have invested a tremendous amount on, in is data science. And we do that at the top of the funnel. So when you invite somebody, for example, to participate in Livongo, you have to know like, why would they care, right? It's not enough just to send a message. It's not enough to send a message with certain colors. You have to understand the invitation, what the value system is to them and allow them to bring in. So we see our enrollment rates across our book of business in the mid 30% um, for the eligible population, which is incredibly high, but that's really driven off of a data science approach. And I can give you some examples when we first started the company, we had very low enrollment rates in the Southeast of the United States. And we couldn't quite figure out why, but it is because we were offering a solution for people with diabetes. And we realized that in the Southeast, people use different um, vernacular. They often say they have a quote unquote, touch of the sugars, but not diabetes. And oh. so when we changed the words and invited people in that resonated differently, you know, when people for, with type one diabetes like myself, I use, 10 blood glucose strips a day. So this idea of free and unlimited blood glucose strips that show up at my door, you had me at hello, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you need to understand what it is that's different for each person. So Kristen talked about that in her job administering the plan across a varied population. 
is really dependent. You know, she can't do the heavy lifting for every solution that she brings for her entire population. Just it's an inordinate amount of work, right? And so as digital health starts to make inroads and leverage data science, this is the place where we can really, I think, um, accelerate our, our um, the, the benefit. Um, we use that same concept across the solution, across the journey, so we can notice, you know, Jessica hasn't checked her blood glucose in the morning, Kristen's checking 14 times, but it's always at night, right, and you can make suggestions and, and alter behavior because of that, and so the hyper-personalization that we all experience when we now go on to Travelocity, I get it when I get in my car, it, you know, at five in the morning, I go to swim three days a week, and it knows at five in the morning when I get in my car, it tells me how many miles and the time to the pool. Like it's gotten that personalized, right? So we're doing that in health. And so we're bringing that data science to make it really personalized in an experienced way that allows people to engage and want to stay engaged because we're giving them something of value back. We're not asking them to do something different without giving value. I want to take a question from the crowd. So um, please continue to submit your questions. We are going through those. Um, there have been a couple about in about utilization, specifically on the behavioral health solution. So Kristen, if you could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, we know during the pandemic, there's been you know an, an uptick in needing those services. So can you say a little bit more about utilization um, on the behavioral health side of things? And I think, I mean, I love I love everything you two have said so far, really, un, or it's, it, it, it weaves together nicely because it really is about building that trust. And I think when we talk about behavioral health services, I mean, this is an area where there's still a lot of stigma. Certain populations might think this is not something I want to do. So it's like, how, how do you, what utilization are you seeing, Kristen? And, and how do you hope to, you know, make that even more broadly available or make it broadly accessible or make it accepted that this is a, this is a thing to do? So um, I don't have any statistics in front of me um, from Lavongo's perspective on behavioral health. That being said, um, from the outset of the pandemic, we paid very close attention to our to our um, you know our uh, RX data and prescriptions for antidepressant, anti-anxiety, um, ADHD, any overlap between you know folks that are getting AD increased ADHD for a dependent and increased antidepressant, like really trying to take a data-driven approach, um, and also looking at obviously our medical claims information. Um, and we haven't seen a huge spike on the medical side. Um, I think it's it's really it's going to be the the impact that we're going to see over the next few months. I think everybody went into this crisis mode. We can get through this. And now, as we're starting the school year, normalcy is not returning um, in the near future. Um, you know, I'm guessing, but uh, I think that's where all of our clinicians and chief. You know, psychiatric officers that work with us through our um, vendor partners have said that's that's what's coming. Um, a couple of suggestions on utilization and stigma. I always like to approach it as um, when we're having a webinar on behavioral health or making these resources available. It, it might not be for you, but you need to know what's available for your child or your spouse or for your colleague. How can I inform you about the health plan that you and your colleagues have access to so that you can reach out to that friend in need? And in that learning process, you might learn that you, you might be exhibiting some signs of depression or anxiety, but it's a much less um, uh, intimidating thing to learn about um, signs of depression or anxiety or other behavioral health issues if, it's, if I'm informing you so that you can help somebody else. And in the process, you're then learning about it um, for your own, for either yourself or for a loved one. I think playing uh, leadership, playing a role and demonstrating that stigma is um, something that needs to be dealt with um, is really important. Um, the treasurer's office um, in New Jersey has been really supportive in being involved in some behavioral health summits we've run. I've shared my own personal story um, on struggling with uh, behavioral health issues and depression. Um, because I think that's, I think that needs to be a big first step um, to have that open and honest conversation and for people to be honest with themselves um, and seek help. Jenny, say a little bit about uh, my strength, which is the behavioral health offering of, available through Livongo. And I'm curious to if you just for those who, who are, may not be as familiar with it, if you could talk a little bit about it, some of the things that you've been seeing during the pandemic in terms of utilization there. And then if if you can, and I know there's limitations on what you can say, but maybe where this is headed, you know, now with, with the with the augmented ability of what's available via Teladoc. Yeah, thank thank you. So the um 
the Livongo Behavioral Health Solution, which we got a jump start on by acquiring my strength, uh, which is that the time of the acquisition is the leading behavioral health solution in the marketplace. What um, that team had done is build out a tremendous amount of digital self-service um, components. So to Kristen's point, people could actually take access or their dependent or could access or their child could access it and understand, you know, there's different modules and they could, they could find the one that worked best for them or they could go through that in a very destigmatized way. So that was at their privacy, in their bedroom, wherever they were when they wanted to do that. Um, uh, we have seen, um, I, I do know the statistics for Livongo, um, and so we have seen an increase of 136% between January and May of this year in terms of utilization for our behavioral health solution. I'll give the subtext that, you know, when we did the acquisition of my strength, our coaching team was the, probably the most excited because they spend the most time live with our members and their comment was consistently, most of my time I'm talking about behavioral health issues. People are reaching out. I'm a diabetes coach and they're wanting to talk about mental health and the stresses that are impacting their diabetes. So the overlay is very, very clear again as we go back to that whole person component. Um, but the moving forward, one of the areas, again, we're really excited about is, is a very clear escalation. Teladoc has built beautiful business around the telehealth services and providers of therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. And putting that couple to the front end of the digital, again, allows somebody to come in at their own pace, their own needs, and then escalate to the person that they need when they need that. And that is just, you know, you talk about um, the stigma and the difficulties in treating those of us with behavioral health, that ability to have the privacy and to and access 24 by seven, no matter who you are, or where you are, is an incredible leap forward. It's no longer digital only or no longer straight to a therapist. That combination is really, really powerful. All right, I wanna um, take another question from the audience. And this one, Kristen, we're going to start out with you. Um, it, you have a, a, a kindred spirit out there, someone else who is in a similar role in a, in a state as you are. And they're wondering, how did you get started in buying? Um, how did you get started in accelerating your buying towards digital health? And so I, this was actually a question I had for you too, because it, when you were presenting, you were talking about all these different point solutions. And then you guys have kind of landed on a couple of different platform plays, Lavongo being one of them. So I'd love to hear though how you got started in kind of building out this more uh, virtual care approach. Um, so as you read from my background, I don't, I didn't grow up in healthcare, so I'm fairly new to it. And so when I came to healthcare with the state and at Treasury, I really did a deep dive on cost, right? Where, and what are the solutions that are out there that can help us reduce costs, right? So. ER spend, urgent care spend. Well, why would I, you know, why would I spend a thousand dollars taking my daughter to the urgent care for an earache when I could do it for $39 on the platform that Horizon uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, who is our TPA, current TPA, has available for our members. My, one of my first questions at our first meeting is what's the utilization of telemedicine? And it was less than, I believe, like 0.1% in a given year. So, well, why aren't we promoting this? This is a no-brainer. Well, that disrupts the status quo. The provider community at the time didn't want necessarily for us to, to move in that direction. Um, so for me, it was a, initially driven by a cost. And then as I dug more into the data and learning about um, comorbidities and behavioral health and, and really the benefit from a cost perspective of a whole person approach to care, um, I mean, it was a no-brainer. And, and the practicalities of moving forward, those are always challenging when you're dealing with um, an organization of our size and the, the vendors that we have to deal with because of our size. Um, but we found great partners um, you know, in uh, our TPA um, and willingness to think outside the box and find these solutions for our members. Um, but we're also of a size where we can demand, you know, if we want something, um, we ask them to, to get it done for us. Okay. Um, so we've had some some strong partnership in that as so well. So they were bringing ideas to you or you were bringing ideas to them? Um, I think uh, initially it was uh, an us bringing ideas to them. Um, but that was, I think that was more as a result of sort of that set it, forget it mentality that had um, really taken hold within um, our health plan. Um, 
but they've really gotten excited about some of the things that we're willing to look at and entertain as we've moved forward into a you know more sort of or I'll say progressive path um, towards digital and point solutions. All right, Jenny, I want to ask you, you know, as a former clinician, uh, to weigh in on, on part of Kristen's answer there, and this might be an unfair question to ask, but we're going to ask you, you used to be a clinician, so when, when, you, when somebody in Kristen's position is trying to win over the provider community and integrate these digital solutions in, give us some tips about how to talk to the clinicians about this and how to get them won over to the digital side. Yeah, and my mom will, re will remind you, Jessica, that I still am a clinician. I sometimes have to tell her I still see patients, so she understands what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, all joking aside, the, the, um, I, I do think that the physician and clinician community is, is changing. I'm seeing that even at the level of medical schools, they're starting to talk about and teach to digital health solutions. The way to win um, for, for a clinician is twofold. One is it makes your life easier, and two, it actually allows you to practice at the top of your licensure. So by making your life easier, there's, there's something, um, so a blood thinner called Coumadin, and it's really difficult to manage because the dose is interacts with a bunch of leafy greens. So if you eat more salad one day than the next, your, your numbers go up and down. There was a world in which clinicians would just write a prescription for Coumadin clinic, and then Coumadin clinic experts would go take care of that and manage that. And the actual doc didn't have to do all of that work. That's how I think a lot about digital solutions on the outset. The beauty of the integration of the data back into the clinician workflow, and this really speaks to the power of Teladoc and Livongo, is that we now allow those providers to say, hey, I'm at risk for these people who are not doing well, or I'm, you know, I need to do perform these procedures on these people, and I want to bring them in. I don't actually need to see Jenny because she's doing really well and she's healthy. I want to actually fill up my calendar with a population that I can take care of, work at the top of my licensure, and frankly, bill at an appropriate level and keep the healthy people outside. That's novel in healthcare, and how powerful to be to be the person, the patient, to say, oh, it's great. Like I actually don't need to take that medication, or I don't need to see the provider. And then when the recommendation comes in to see, you're more likely to do it rather than than you know every four weeks or every four months is just kind of the standard for all of us. So providers, I think once you experience this as an extension um, and a leverage in the care system, I think it becomes incredibly appealing. Right. Jack, I just, can I just um, echo on that? So we have direct primary care um, homes that we've implemented with our, and so what we do um, and what we've done with Lavongo is said, brought Lavongo in and said, can you train our DPCs on what the product is and what the offering is? And they're so excited about the fact that they can, you know, they have their panel of patients that they see, and now they have this tool that can help them manage you know, their patient's chronic conditions. And it's, they're so excited about it. So I think as we also move into this more, um, whether it's direct primary care model or value-based care model, um, they're going to meet these types of solutions with excitement and not, um, you know, with trepidation as, as Jenny said. Okay, I've got about a minute or two to wrap this up. And so I'd like you guys to just leave us with, I guess, your, your, your forecast for the future here. Whip out your crystal ball real quick, a lightning round of what you think is going to happen next. So Jenny, I guess I'll start with you, um, Dr. Schneider, uh, if you wouldn't mind weighing in uh, for, for your mom, uh, if you wouldn't mind weighing in on, on what you think, you know, what would you like to see happen next as far, far as virtual care, whole person approach, you know, and, and think, thinking broadly in terms of healthcare and what you guys have started here with Livongo and Teladoc and what that's meant in the industry? Yeah, I, I really see this world in front of us um, and driven in, in large part by Kristen and her colleagues and people because the healthcare system has been broken. So there's a clear need. So people are interested in doing this, which is why there's an incredible opportunity to change the care delivery system such that we can reach more people at a lower cost with higher outcomes and a far, far better experience. And it is this coupling coupling of digital components that connect into provider systems that has underlying data that powers the providers when the individuals see those providers and it empowers the, the digital components that interact directly with those individuals that sits throughout and allows that hyper-personalized 
I believe that you know the reason the Livongo Teladoc merger at eighteen point five billion dollars is so exciting is because it just heralds that the ship has turned and there's two leading. Um, uh, companies that are putting that together to truly change and steer the delivery, healthcare delivery system. I believe you're going to see a number of individual people come to the table and create that along with us, beside us, compete with us. I think that's all wonderful because we're all in an effort to make every single person's life better, deliver higher value, and do that on behalf of our clients and on behalf of our members. So this is an incredibly exciting time to be in digital healthcare, um, and it's accelerating from both the, the, the consumer in and the provider out, both sides of that are, you're seeing an enormous acceleration. All right, Kristen is one of those people who's responsible for orchestrating the, the plan design and, and mobilizing the populations of employees who are gonna get us there and use that great system that Jenny just described. What do you think? How, how far off are we from that? And what do you expect coming up next? I think we're much closer post COVID or during as a result of COVID um, but I think we have a lot of work to do. Again, I'll just echo my point. I think as a healthcare system, we've lost trust of our members um, as a result of the way that the system has worked or not worked for some time. And so we need to gain that trust back in, able, in order to in, engage our members and help them engage in their healthcare journey in a positive way. And um, you know, I think Lavango is the type of tool and solution that will get us there. And I think there will be more, more of them as time goes on because the demand's there. It's time. It's time. I love it. Let's leave it there. All right. Uh, Kristen Deacon from the state of New Jersey, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Jenny Schneider from Livongo, thank you for your time as well. It's been a pleasure to speak with you both. Um, if, if your questions went unanswered during this webinar, rest assured someone will be reaching out to you to make sure that all of your inquiries are satisfied. And if you want to check out Livongo, please do so on their website. It is livongo.com. And hey, if you want to check out my interviews on WTF Health, I am on YouTube. You can find me there. Just search WTF Health. Again, I'm Jessica DeMassa. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to host this session. We'll talk to you soon. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you.